Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Welcome. It's April 1st. We're back with a new episode. Uh, Danielle, is there some public safety announcement we should be making about this month? Is there something important that happens this month? Or Are you talking about me and my bees? <laughs> What's going on with your bees? Look, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. Oh, no, you're talking about taxes. Uh, well, let's. I think we should hit them both. Okay. So, yes, taxes are due this month. Just a reminder to everyone, you've got plenty of time. Don't freak out. If you're listening He's to this on the first, you're good. Still freaking out. And I'm filming this weeks in advance. <laughs> still freaking out. Yes, taxes. But also, you guys, watch out for bees. Bees are coming out. There's usually someone local. If you have a swarm near you or you think you have bees in your house, you can kill call. them all. No, do not spray them. It oh. will hurt my heart. Oh, there's resources out there. You can just give people a call and they can usually come and safely remove it. There's like, you know, clubs, there's county clubs typically, and they'll come and help you out because we want to save the bees. You know, I've They're already super... started doing it here in North Carolina. There's bees absolutely everywhere. So if you're warm and blooming, the bees yeah. are zooming. I just created Ooh, that off the top of my head. I like proud it. Of me? <laughs> I do. I do. So cheesy. <laughs> and you've actually, you're, you, in a way, you're kind of a rescue for some bees at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. So yep. one of these hives was located somewhere and uh, it yep. was brought to Danielle and mm -hmm. she's, she's taking care of that queen and, yep. and all her little we drones. Nine in last year. And that's just us. And there's multiple people in the area. So this is wow. a very common thing. And I just feel like people don't. They're not aware, you know, and they don't know what's going on. Yeah. And they kind of see yeah. bees and freak out and want to get rid of them. And I understand that. But just saying, hey, guess what? There's people like me out there that rescue them. <laughs> yeah. And we know bees are important to the environment yeah. and pollination and all kinds mm -hmm. of other stuff. So take care of those bees. I, I didn't know anything about it, guys. Like this is all new news to me, too. But I know it's important. And I wanted to share it with you guys and let Danielle get out her public safety message mm -hmm. for the bees. So. And also taxes, which is gross. But yeah. And yeah, the gross. That's the gross thing. That's, <laughs> that's what we really should be looking thing. to kill. Yeah. <laughs> the tax. <laughs> um, all right. I think we should get right to the results so we could get to. I'm really excited to go back and revisit world's worst alibis. But oh, first, man. yeah. First, we got to see what happened with the results for our last episode, which was law and odor, where we dove nose first into mm -hmm. some of the smelliest crimes ever. Danielle told the story of a first class airline passenger who wanted to prove he actually had no class mm, by Which he did very well. He sure did. He was crapping on everything, Danielle. Yep. It was ridiculous. And I told the legend of BOB, the BO Bandit, and how that name has been used throughout the years. How did it all play out, Danielle? Well, I should say, how did I win? Well, John, on the yes. Twitter poll. Mm hmm I received 81% of the votes. <laughs> oh, what? Are you reading <laughs> you that right? <laughs> yeah, you received 19%. What? And then on the website poll, I received 84% of the votes and you what? received 16%. What? What? It's like I didn't show up. I think I no. would have the same score if I just sat there silently for 10 no. minutes. <laughs> that is, look, I'm just saying that is... Uh, those were some crazy stories, but I don't think anyone is going to be able to move past the fact that a man just full on pulled his butt out in front of everyone on an airplane and took a big crap. That's true. Like, That's I don't true. think there's. Well, and to be fair, oh, I, I did. I did think about it. And yeah. in a way, I felt like I was cheating. And ultimately, I wound up cheating myself out of the victory because I, I was telling multiple stories. Oh, I thought it was great. I thought it added right to the fun of it yeah but you know typically we focus on one case like in hindsight looking back on it now i might have done things differently especially knowing that i'd only get 16 percent of the votes from the website i'm telling poll. you but still i don't think most of that's on you that man was just a character. it's true it's true it's true he uh he was amazing at crapping on things in an airplane oh gosh, so yeah how how could i have competed with that <laughs> Today, the topic suggestion came from you guys out mm -hmm. there. You wanted us to revisit the world's worst alibis, and here we are. Now, I think many of us consider that a solid alibi is a quick way to get removed from being on a list of suspects in any criminal investigation. But 
does not being able to remember or being able to prove where you were really point to a guilty person? Well, a 2017 research article titled The Illusion of the Perfect Alibi was published in the Journal of Investigative Psychology and Offender Profiling. Now, this research study tried to understand just how easy it should be for someone to have a true alibi and the evidence to support it if they were indeed innocent. Which is a good, like, it's interesting they would think yeah. about trying to get a baseline mm -hmm. on the tr the truth of an alibi. Like, exactly. would, it, would a general person be able to prove that, or first of all, remember and say, yeah, I exactly. was at this place, but then be able to prove it. So they took over 800 participants of varying ages, which I love. They didn't just focus on like, you know, college Yeah, because lifestyles are so different. Yeah. Well, and it happens a lot in these... Mm -hmm in these studies where they'll focus on a particular group. They knew what they were going for. So they had people ranging in age. I think the youngest was, I think it was 18 up into people in their seventies. Yeah. And they essentially accused these people of a fake robbery that happened in one of 16 different time frames that was spread out on either Tuesday or Saturday of the previous week, which once again, I just, the yeah. thought they put into this is amazing because like they're thinking, okay. also weekend. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, how many people had an alibi? Nearly all of the participants were able to report where they were. 99.5%. But of those people who had an alibi, only 25% had physical evidence to support it. I feel like that would be the group I'd be in. Like, how do you prove just sitting at your house or? yeah. Yeah. Knowing absolutely. where you were, I'm also kind of impressed by that because sometimes I'm like, what did I do yesterday? <laughs> I, I know. And <laughs> even though they're talking about just the previous yeah. week, which I think is definitely skewing this result a mm -hmm. bit. But I agree. I mean, also think about like a criminal investigation. Like if there was a real robbery and if you were a true suspect, they're probably going to be talking to you, you know, within a week. Pretty within, quickly. With, exactly. Yeah. A few weeks, <clears throat> at least for your initial interview. Uh, so of those people, 90% of them, of the people that had their alibi, 90% of them had a witness to actually back up their alibi. And 63% of them actually had two or more witnesses to back them up. So you being at home, Danielle, mm -hmm. as long as you're there with your husband and your kids, yeah. like you've got several witnesses. When a participant wasn't able to provide any evidence to support their alibi, they were usually at home alone, mm -hmm. to your point. Man, now when it comes to the physical evidence, the most common type was a receipt. However, which this is interesting to me, receipts are considered the weakest form of physical evidence for an alibi. Only 7% had the strongest form, which was obviously video recorded evidence. Yeah, it's interesting to me too, because I can understand why a receipt isn't super strong because it's, I mean, especially if you paid cash, but if you used a That's credit a card, a little stronger because they can but, kind of tie that back to you but i guess it doesn't necessarily prove that you were the one who made the purchase right right however the receipt is basically in terms of an investigative tool mm -hmm. it's the step to get you to the strongest form which yeah, you exactly. said seven percent of them had which mm -hmm. was video recorded evidence most of those types of interactions where you're going to get a receipt you're probably walking into a business and especially nowadays there's a very good chance that they're going to have some form of camera in there yeah so in terms of the perfect alibi, most of these backed by eyewitness accounts, which quite honestly, we're getting to a point where a lot of people aren't trusting eyewitness accounts very yeah. strongly anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, then receipts, which aren't trusted as much. And then of course the 7% that had the most trusted, which was video recording. But keep in mind, this is when people were asked about a crime that happened just the previous week. Ultimately, from this, it sounds to me like alibis are really easy to come by and for even the majority of people to remember, mm -hmm. but very hard to prove. Proving it, yeah. And uh, how does that play into things? I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if maybe one of these, if all of them, are going to come into play during today's cases. I have a feeling we're going to see some of that happen. And uh, let's get right to it. Let's get to our first world's worst alibi story. No, wait, this is actually the third world's yep. worst alibi story because we're doing part. I'm trying to keep it all straight. Go ahead, Daniel. Just fix it for me. <laughs> fix it. Well, I, I don't I can fix it because I have to say, and I've already talked to John about this, diving into the research. I was like, oh, we had such a great time last time. We were able to find lots of stories. I re-listened to the episode and then I opened up Google. 
I don't know how we did it. <laughs> I know. I know. I don't know how we pulled this off last time a couple of years ago because it is slim pickings out there. It's been absolutely crazy. But I managed to find one. And this is a terrible alibi. But it's almost even worse how this woman acted in regards to the alibi. Hmm. So on December 1st, 2016, 73-year-old Linnea Levy headed out mid-morning to run a few errands in her town of Chilliwack, British Columbia. I'm fairly certain I'm pronouncing that right. Chilliwack, got, I think. Yeah, it's somewhere Chilliwack? in there. Chilli I, I Chilliwack. I think so. I, I think like so. that better than Chilliwack. Chilliwack. <laughs> <laughs> Chilliwack. She hopped in her truck and first headed to the CIBC bank that sat on the corner of Princess Avenue and Young Road. She made a withdrawal then began to make her way to nearby Southgate Mall only a few blocks away. She was enjoying her day. She went to the food court where she had, you know, a nice, quiet and casual lunch. She was there by herself. And once fueled up, she started to begin her rounds at nearby stores. She visited a handful of different shops around the mall. She went to a UPS store where she had a mailbox she regularly went to check and had friendly conversation with multiple employees. But while this seems like a typical afternoon, just, you know, someone going about their day, just down the road, sirens were wailing. 78-year-old Farouk Farouzian was heading out to run errands of her own. Farouk was very well known in the community. She was very well loved. She frequently helped to make and serve meals to the homeless community. She participated in multiple outreach groups assisting those in need. And on this particular morning, you know, Farouk being Farouk, she was walking through Chilliwack on her way to donate food to the community service center. Her family said she literally would budget this into her weekly groceries Wow! to make sure that she could provide just a little bit extra. And after she made this donation, she was looking forward to participating in a lunchtime conversation circle for new immigrants in the area. So she's just like this very active community member. I think her son said she just started like taking up kickboxing at the, at the age of 78. Like she's just, you know, she's getting it. But unfortunately, something had gone very wrong. Now, as Farouk was crossing Mary Street in Chilliwack and Patton Avenue just after noon on this day, she was struck by a vehicle. Now, mm. onlookers immediately ran to her aid and called emergency services in an attempt to get her help. As she was transported to the hospital, she did unfortunately succumb to her injuries, but authorities immediately jump into an investigation because despite many people staying to help this woman, the person responsible had fled the scene. Mm, hit and run. Mm hmm. Witnesses began giving statements to authorities saying, you know, look, we saw this truck. It was traveling south down Mary Street. It was only going like 18 to 25 miles an hour. So it's not like this person was like speeding through and purposely hit her or something. Just regardless, the driver clearly had missed Farouk on the crosswalk and proceeded to hit her. But what shocked these witnesses the most is, you know, the fact that they watched this happen. The driver paused a moment to clearly look and see what happened. And they were like expecting this person to run from the vehicle, try to help, just drove off, right. just continued driving south. So witnesses watched as the truck turned left onto Ontario. So it's like a block away and then disappeared. So they kept their eyes on this truck. The witnesses in this were great. And while they couldn't believe obviously what had just happened, their first priority was obviously to help Farouk. But they were able to give an amazing description of the truck to investigating authorities a description of the woman that was driving it. One person even managed to jot down the license plate real quick before going to help Farouk. So these people were on top of it. Mm -hmm. There was also a piece of debris from the vehicle that was left at the scene. And so authorities were like, you know what? We've got so much here. We should easily be able to find the perpetrator. Like, we've got this. And so right away, a search for this vehicle began. So authorities put a bolo out for the truck. They began to check all of the nearby parking lots thinking, okay, maybe someone dumped the car after this because that's something that's very commonly done. Maybe they're somewhere watching to see how we're reacting to what happened. If there's any witnesses talking and luckily within two hours, they found the truck. So the truck was in the Southgate mall parking lot, which from this intersection was about two blocks away, right off of Ontario. Okay. And the truck was not empty. There were two passengers inside. So in the driver's seat of the car was an unidentified male. His name's not ever been released. And in the passenger seat was 73-year-old Lania Libby. So right away, authorities noticed 
There's damage on this truck in the exact location that witnesses said it would be. And the missing part of the car found at the scene fit into Linnea's car like a puzzle piece. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. They were able to, you know, question the male that had been sitting in the driver's seat for obvious reasons. Like, were you driving the car? They quickly realized he was not. He was not in the car at the time that this happened. He didn't obviously match the description of the person said to be driving the vehicle. And so he was released and Linnea was arrested and held in custody to be questioned. They had her plate. They had her car. She fit the description. She was in the area. They figured that, you know, this was just going to be a simple open and closed situation. They could, you know, get justice for Farouk incredibly easily. But when authorities confronted Linnea about the death of Farouk due to this accident that they believed she may have run away from, Linnea's like, oh, no, no, no. This is just one giant misunderstanding. Yeah, because that's logical. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so Linnea begins to tell authorities this elaborate story of her morning, claiming that there was absolutely no way that she could possibly be responsible for this hit and run accident because she had an alibi and witnesses to confirm it. Okay. Linnea proceeded to tell them that she had been at the mall all morning and all afternoon. She hadn't been out driving in her truck at any point. She was too busy shopping. And she said, you know, I've gone to different stores. I went and enjoyed lunch at the food court. I spoke to various employees and they can all vouch for me that I was there. And when it came to how her truck had damage and her plate had been recorded at the scene, you're like, okay, how she, can she possibly get around that? She had an explanation. Linnea claims not only was I not the one to do this because I was inside the mall shopping, but when I arrived this morning, there was a panhandling woman in the parking lot. And Linnea proceeds to say that this woman somehow stole her truck while she was shopping. During the escape after taking the truck, ended up hitting Farouk, then in a panic, not wanting to be tied to two crimes, she brought the truck back to the mall and parked it exactly where she found it before then fleeing the scene. Because, you know, it all makes perfect sense. She's innocent. That's a criminal genius right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Take the take the vehicle right back. And and did she um, unhot wire the car too? Like, how did she yeah. start the truck? <laughs> exactly. This panhandler, you know, just right. knew exactly how to hot wire a car, quickly did it. Yeah. And then un in, unhot wire it. The yeah. whole thing. Just And there was no evidence of that, you know, somehow right. did that with not, no trace of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, police didn't believe a bit of this story <laughs> for a handful of very obvious reasons. But it would end up taking a lot more investigative work to finally make an arrest in the case. While they knew that the car was involved, none of the witnesses when shown photographs of Linnea could say for certain that she was the one that was driving. They knew it was a woman. She did match the description, but they couldn't say, oh, yeah, that's absolutely her. So she personally couldn't be tied to the crime. And we all know just because it's like the receipt thing we're talking about, just because the car was there doesn't necessarily mean she right. was the one driving it. So they had to check into this alibi she's giving that. I was shopping, couldn't have possibly done it. It was a panhandler. Well, and you also had this older gentleman that mm -hmm. was in the car as well. Like, was it possible that, you know, she went to the mall and did her shopping and he took the vehicle? And Yep. Uh, yeah. Just a lot of questions here. Now, over the next 10 months, the community mourned, held vigils, celebrated the life of Farouk, you know, the remembering her, while authorities worked diligently on the case. And at this point, they strongly believe that she fabricated this entire story. They just mm. had to prove it. So they began to try and work out a timeline to see if it was possible that Linnea was in the area a little bit later than she was making it seem. And they were very quickly able to find out that this was not just a casual day of running errands. And all of this was basically a false alibi cover-up. <laughs> Authorities were able to find that Linnea had no plans of even going to the mall that day. She had gone to the bank that morning, which I've already stated, but she never offered that up when questioned by authorities, likely because the timestamp on her withdrawal that morning placed her at the bank on Princess Avenue at 12.11 p.m., just mm -hmm. minutes before Farouk was hit two blocks away. They theorized that Linnea had gone to the bank, turned out onto Princess Avenue before turning down Mary, where the accident occurred. And at that point, they believed she likely panicked, went to the nearby mall specifically to create an alibi for herself. Oh, wow. Because that's a normal person's thought process. Seriously. Yeah. Like right away, let me pull immediately into this mall and run in here and do everything I can to try to get myself out of this. Insane. Now, not only did they have evidence of Linnea at the bank just prior to the accident, but they also had footage when she arrived at the actual mall 
She had not been at the mall all morning. They already knew this, but again, to confirm it, she had arrived at 1221, so just minutes after the accident. Yeah. And it seems like her plan, you know, to be captured on surveillance and create an alibi was not going how she had hoped it would, like at mm. all. When they went to speak to employees at the mall, they did confirm that she had been there, like Lydia was there that afternoon, but many of them said her behavior was a little bit off. She seemed stressed when she went to get her lunch, and authorities actually believe that she did that first to like have a moment to sit down and figure out what she was going to do and also be seen in one of the most public open places of the entire mall. Sure, sure. Then she started going around random stores to try to build up this story to make it seem plausible. And while all of these employees did confirm seeing her, there was actually one that was familiar with her and could comment more on her strange behavior. So I'd already brought up the UPS store and how she had a mailbox there. And so she frequently went there. People were familiar. And authorities spoke with the employee that had been working that day. And this employee claimed that Linnea did come in and she was acting paranoid. She was checking her mail, but she kept looking back and forth to the door like she was worried about something. She was looking out at the parking lot, almost like she was waiting for someone to come or to see something in particular. She's probably looking for police cars. Yeah. Um, and apart from these witnesses and the timestamp going against her alibi, authorities were even able to connect the car further through forensic testing. They did find Fruke's DNA on the wheel well. So they're, I mean, they're just connecting everything here. So 10 months after the hit and run, Linnea was formally arrested and charged with failure to stop at the scene of an incident that result resulted in bodily injury or death. But they did make it clear during this. They're like, we're not charging you with murder. Yeah. We're not out to prove intent. But your actions <laughs> after this were unacceptable. And your ridiculous alibi had us running in circles and just delayed justice because we're over here chasing our tails, trying to corroborate this alibi that you are like sticking to. Well, and it created a need for justice. If exactly. she would have just stopped and mm -hmm. tried to help and just been yep. a decent human to another human being, like I, I get that she was freaked out. I mean, quite honestly, I was worried you were going to tell me that she wasn't even aware of it. Like, you know, she had just hit this woman and then kind of yep. went on with just, her day. But um, awful. yeah, yeah, that's, oh, man, that's really, really sad. But she was not giving up. What? Mm-hmm. For the next four years, while awaiting trial, Linnea maintained that she was innocent and that her alibi checked out. She kept with the story that it was the panhandling woman, and she couldn't have been there because she was at the mall. And authorities suddenly began to, interestingly, receive letters from witnesses that seemed to back up this idea. One after another, these letters of concern came in, placing Linnea at the mall at the time of the hit and run. And not just that, but these witnesses also seemed particularly infuriated with the police department. <laughs> what the heck? Saying that they had pinned Linnea for the crime and directly accused them of misconduct. <laughs> so, like, these aren't just witnesses that are, like, ugh, just out of the blue, like, never been right. spoken to before. All of a sudden, they're like, how dare We have we? an opinion. Yeah, we have an opinion yeah, on like, this. like, <laughs> not just are we a witness, but we also have a very strong opinion, and we think this department is absolutely awful, misconduct, yada, yada. So authorities, you know, but this is one of those things where it's a double-edged sword. Unfortunately, they have no choice but to look into these. <laughs> yeah. And so authorities started to follow up on these letters, and as I'm sure all of you are guessing, most of them came from people that they couldn't locate. No way. I'm so Imagine surprised. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But interestingly, one of the letters was signed by a local bank manager. Okay. Now, there wasn't a lot of information here. I'm assuming it was likely the bank manager of the bank that Linnea stopped at prior to the hit and run. Mm -hmm. And if that were the case, my assumption would be that the letter would likely say something about how the withdrawal time was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. kind of questioning receipts and things like that. Yeah. Um. But authorities are like, we're going to go check this out. This is the only legitimate person we've been able to find connected to these letters. And guess what? Bank manager had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. Oh, she just used the person's name and just sent it in cold. Wow. She sure did. She was like, I did not write this letter. This is not me. It was forged. What year is this? This happened 2016. Did they trace her cell phone? I'm not sure, but... I mean, she might not have one. Well, exactly. But yeah. they did put all of these letters together. And they're like, 
let's look at these. And they noticed that there were very similar spelling and grammar mistakes throughout a lot of them. And when they compared that to correspondences they had with Linnea, it matched. And they also were like, wait a minute, some of these have been faxed in, which is already bizarre in its own. <laughs> Way to show your age in this case. Exactly. <laughs> We're receiving faxes? That machine yes. hasn't run in two in years. Like literally <laughs> probably longer than two years. Like it's probably been yeah. just sitting there and they've dusted it off like every couple of right. years and it's just not used. And all of a sudden, all it of warms a sudden, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, I can hear the noise now. I know. And they're like, wait a minute. What is that? <laughs> yeah. Wait, did some of these come in by carrier pigeon? <laughs> Oh my gosh, see? <laughs> Letter by pigeon. No, because that would probably oh. be me. <laughs> oh my goodness. But oh. they look at it. They're like, you can trace where a fax came from. It came from freaking Linnea's house. <laughs> Her home fax machine. Yeah, that's a great thing about faxes. It's been a while since I've thought about this, but they have the number that yes, it, they're coming from. there's a number from. that it comes from. Yeah, stamped right on the top of the page. <laughs> and I'm just like, all this effort, and you're going to do wow. that. So needless to say. I mean, she's just upsetting them to the point that they want to throw the book at her harder. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, you know? and it doesn't stop. These letters were literally just another desperate attempt to have her alibi hoax believe. Like, she so strongly wanted them to believe her alibi. And I was actually looking into this because we know I'm always looking into the psychology of, of things, you know, to explain why someone would have this thought process. And there's like something, there's like studies out there about people at a certain point, again, start to believe their own lies. And mm. I mean, there is a chance that she genuinely, in order to justify what happened or in her brain what she did, she, I don't know, maybe that's it. Or maybe she just was so determined to, yeah. I don't, I honestly, I can't say. But she stood her ground and delayed the trial repeatedly. Like she was mm -hmm. doing everything in her power. She fired attorney after attorney after attorney. She gave numerous excuses. So after 19 adjournments. 19 of them. Wow. Judge Brown finally was like, forget it. We're done. We're not doing this. No more excuses. No more. I'm firing my attorney. We need to restart this. Your trial is set for February 2021. Like all those years, all that time. Yeah. And because she had fired all of her attorneys, Linnea showed up to represent herself. Now, authorities were able to provide clear evidence proving that Linnea's alibi was false obviously, and evidence to connect her to the crime, including four witnesses that were there. Not only had she hit someone and then fled the scene, but she also apparently had been driving without a license, which just mm. like sprinkles more chaos on top of it. But Linnea continued her trope about this panhandling car stealing woman in court. She took the stand herself and retold the same story that they had such solid proof was false. I mean, totally knocked her alibi out and she was not letting it go. She provided absolutely no solid evidence or proof other than she thought she was right. Now, hold on a second. How old was she when this happened? I thought you said she was in her 70s. 73. And this is five years later, she's sitting on the stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's 78 years old. And she's just holding on to this yes, story, representing sure herself, Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> driving without a license, which, by the way, I was going to go on my usual. Mm -hmm. I know you've heard the rant before about how we don't have good mechanisms for taking away people's driving rights at some no. point. No. OK, yeah. listen, all I have to do is tell you about any experiences I had with my grandmother when she would pick me up from school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. But even that doesn't oh. apply here because she was driving without a license as it was. Oh, yeah. Wow. She was just doing it anyways. So ultimately, despite her attempts, she was ultimately convicted on April 12th, 2021. And you would think, okay, we finally have justice for Farouk, okay? She's got to be tired of lying at this point. She's got to be tired of trying to get out of this. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. Do you know what she did? The guilty verdict is read. The judge gets up, leaves. Linnea, Linnea stays and says, um, <clears throat> excuse me, can someone bring the judge back into the courtroom? I'd like to speak with her. I wasn't mm. done. <laughs> no. I'm not joking. 
she doesn't retell the story again, does she? Oh, the judge did not come back. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> no. Smart judge. <laughs> I don't know any judge that I think that would. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think any judge in their right mind would go back. Like, everyone has left. Like, you've been found guilty. You are done. You're going to show up for your sentence saying, and you can't just be like, hello, I don't agree. Come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, and so wow. shortly after this, she did go to her sentencing hearing. Um, she was asked what she believed her sentencing should be because what she did and the mm. maximum charge for the crime, I believe, is like life in prison, if I'm remembering correctly from my research. And she said, quote, I don't know what an appropriate sentence would be. All I know is I have extreme health issues. And so okay. she basically is like, I can't go to jail slash prison, wherever you're going to put me a correctional facility. It's like a death sentence for me. You can't do that. And so. They're like, okay, we're going to give you a second sentencing date and you need to provide third party proof of these severe health issues that okay. apparently will lead to your immediate death in jail. <laughs> um, you have until August. August came. She was unable to provide them with anything. Okay. So ultimately she was sentenced to, she got very easy way out in my opinion, only two years an Alouette Correctional Center for Women. And they assured her that, you know, you will have adequate medical care there, you know, to manage any of these health concerns that you're yeah. saying are terrible. Yeah. Um, and then after that, you'll be on probation for two years. There were also multiple no contact orders that had to be put in place to protect the witnesses mm -hmm. because um, she tracked them down. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. tracked them down and she harassed them. And did everything she could, which should come to no surprise. She was just out there doing all she could. She did file an appeal, still holding on to her severe medical issues that she still refused to prove. And the kicker is that she even said that they were they put too much weight into her misleading alibi at her trial. <laughs> they put too what? much weight into it. She's like, you focus too much on the fact that I lied to you. Yeah, because they, they focused so much they figured out she was lying. Yeah, is that, she's that, like, that's, that's now essentially she's it. She's like, you you yeah. look too deep into it. <laughs> yeah, you weren't supposed to look that deep. You were supposed to just believe what I was saying. And exactly. Let me but off. This was just obviously immediately shut down. Judge Brown said, quote, the false alibi was not only dishonest, it prolonged and complicated the investigation. So yeah. this was immediately dismissed. She was told, you have to serve your time. She was like trying to knock it down to nine months instead of two years or like a conditional sentence. I think that like house arrest would potentially be an option, but they were like, you saw what you did to this woman yeah. and then drove off and you didn't even for a moment, like consider what you've done. You immediately went to lie about an alibi, it like might, immediately started creating one. Yeah. It might have been enough, you know, halfway through all the grief that she gave mm -hmm. him. Like she might've yeah. been able to, to get some yep. kind of plea bargain on something like that. But no, but yeah. then you're going to send letters from your at home fax machine. You're going and like, and, and yeah. not just that you're going to accuse them in those letters of misconduct all to save your own butt. And then you're like, Oh, but focused on it too much. Good That's grief. What they do. That's yeah, what they do. That Big life job. lesson. They did a good, they did a good job. <laughs> They did. So huge thank you to bcctvnews.ca, theprogress.com, and vancouveristawesome.com because what in the good googly moogly was yeah. that? Jeez. Jeez. What a mess, Danielle. It's I I feel I feel bad about it on several fronts. I mean, oh, yeah. for a person to lose their life. Mm -hmm. And in a way, she lost, I mean, this went on for practically a decade. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? being wrapped up in a legal fight for a decade and the then thing you know is, having... I genuinely think she enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. To an extent. That's just right. my personal observation, but Yeah. I'm surprised I... she didn't go and try to pay off a uh like a homeless person to say oh, that they geez. were the one or something, you know? Like I just she was well, pulling out I'm... every other trick. I'm sure this wasn't the only thing that she had been trying. I mean, she was yeah obviously getting to the witnesses and trying to get them to be quiet. Like she was doing everything that she possibly could. Mm. Man. Yeah. It's sad. It's sad. Yep. Couldn't do it. I was at the mall and it was a panhandler. Like off the top of your head. How do you create that? Panhandler. <laughs> I mean, I'm well, serious. I, like what? I do have to appreciate. I think it's actually kind of smart in a way not that i want to mm -hmm. encourage people to try to commit crimes no, but and like make how are you gonna find viable. a handler no no but but the aspect of like okay i just 
conducted a crime of some kind, I'm going to go and start building up my alibi right away. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes the time frames aren't so solid. Yep. You know, if, if she was in the mall and she literally like ran right in, grabbed something off the rack, got right into line and paid for it. She could have then kind of fudged the timeline a bit exactly. and was like, well, I was shopping. I was in there for 20 minutes before mm -hmm. I went up with my item. Of course, yep. now you're talking modern technology and there's cameras and they would see her running in. I mean, there's there's still problems with it, but it's, you know, I guess from a, a bit of a different perspective, it's probably not the worst thing to, to, to try to build up yeah. that timeline as close to the event as you exactly. could. Exactly. Um, I'm just like, what kind of mindset, man, do you have to have to just yeah. like your first thought be that? Well, your I first thought is to take off. For like the first, I wouldn't even be able to move. Yeah. I would yeah. be so devastated and in shock that it would just, I don't even, man, I don't even know. Yeah. That's like what is What is going on through her mind? Like, I don't know. There's a thud. Obviously, it had to be a clear enough strike. I mean, if you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, there's a part of the car that's left behind. Yeah. Like, because occasionally we do hear stories about, you know, sometimes elderly people are driving, they, they hit something, they just don't even know it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not what we have here, especially no. if she's tearing off and creating this whacked out alibi. Man. Whew. Well, Danielle, that was that was a deep one. Mm -hmm. A little dark, which yeah. um, I'll be honest, my story is gonna be a little dark too it's just that type of topic it really it really is like the more i was diving deeper into this i was like nine times out of ten these alibis like people are creating are for to cover up terrifying crimes that they've been a part of yeah, yeah. or even if it's someone who successfully used an alibi like they still went through absolute hell and back <laughs> like yep. getting to the point where their alibi is believed it's just like a tough situation all the way around Maybe I knew that these topics were going to be dark today, and that's why I decided to dress up like an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been looking at myself on this monitor. I'm like, I really, I look like an eight-year-old boy. I'm wearing a big, giant hat, uh -huh. which, Danielle, do you know what TC stands for? For crime. That's hey, what I would say. That was the joke I was going to say about it. It's actually for Twin Cities. But yeah, for today's okay. episode, it's that true crime. <laughs> yeah. I would never think it was anything else. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a story to tell. It's going to be right on the other side of this break. Please come right back. I, I couldn't have done it, detective. I was cooking a delicious meal with HelloFresh. I don't know if that alibi is going to work, John. Everyone knows that you can spend less time in the kitchen with quick and easy meals like HelloFresh is fast and fresh. Pineapple chicken tacos and falafel power bowls ready in 15 minutes or less. Shh, Danielle. No, I'm telling you, detective, I had to follow like 500 steps to make this amazing Mexicali black bean soup. And then I had like a thousand dishes to wash. You mean the delicious one pot Mexicali black bean soup, John, topped with blue corn tortilla chips and white cheddar cheese, which only takes six steps to make and leaves you with only one pot to clean? Are, are you trying to get me locked up? I don't think HelloFresh can be delivered to my jail cell, Danielle. Uh-oh. You're just going to have to miss out on the 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items you can order from HelloFresh every single week. Ah, uh, gotcha. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. All right. Well, he was a good detective, Danielle. He knows that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. Plus, when you go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime50 and use code CrimeAfterCrime50, you'll get 50% off plus free shipping. The detective knows I had no reason to rob that bank because I'm saving so much money with HelloFresh. They really are the best. Find out for yourself. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime50 and use code CrimeAfterCrime50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Try America's number one alibi. I mean, uh, meal kit today. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. We are now on to John's story. And I'm super excited. I'm super excited because I feel like I dug into so much research. There's only so many of these out there. So I can't wait to see which one you've chosen. It's true. There are so many of these out there. And this is one of those, you know, have you ever heard that there's a thin line between genius and insanity? Like, yeah, this mm -hmm. is one of those, it depends on how you look at it type of situations. And there's something about it that kind of 
I'm almost personally insulted by, and I'm I'm, I'm oh, curious. No. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I'm curious if you're going to feel the same. Uh, I'm a pretty big fan of video game streamers, right? I love yeah. watching people that are just better gamers than me, or you know, they they have these big crazy characters like Doctor Disrespect, who you know he'll like rage quit and uninstall a game because he <laughs> lost. Uh, as a matter of fact, That's I've like even me? yeah, <laughs> you've done that. <laughs> Oh um, yeah, I'm done with this game. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, I'm never playing this again. I had a friend that actually ejected the game and broke it in half mm. because he played it too much. <laughs> He's like, this is a problem. I gotta stop this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've even actually thought of starting some form of gaming stream myself, but these guys are serious, Danielle. Like they play every day and sometimes they're streaming for like four, six, uh, even 10 hours at a time. I mean, it's no wonder why they're always popping the energy drinks. But obviously, I don't think that true crime and video game content would mix well together. No, probably not. Yeah. But some people do have content that it would kind of blend in with. And 32-year-old Stephen McCullough has a YouTube channel. And in many ways, he actually reminds me of myself when I first got started. I had toys hanging all over my walls behind me. I was doing movie reviews and talking about sci-fi shows. Steven also appears to have a love of media and content creation. He was even featured on the UK version of Robot Wars as a member of Team S-Tech. His LinkedIn profile says, I'm a hardworking, focused individual who provides clear and precise narrations for both video and audio purposes with a unique style, which is easy listening yet exciting. I create and host videos on my own YouTube channel, which has amassed over 40,000 subscribers. He also works part-time as an audience content editor at the Belfast Telegraph, and being in Belfast, he actually does live in Northern Ireland. His primary YouTube channel is called Vote Saxon 07, which is a reference from Doctor Who, and it's one of his favorite topics, apparently. He started the channel in 2010 and is primarily what I would consider a toy reviewer, which I do honestly enjoy myself. There's... Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a nostalgia thing for yeah, kids exactly. from the 80s. Um, you know, I like to keep up on the latest Back to the Future or Michael Keaton Batman toys. Uh, his channel, once again, mainly focused on Doctor Who, Star Wars, and other popular kind of geek content. On the evening of Sunday, December 18th, 2022, so very, very recent, one week before Christmas, Vote Saxon 07 went live on YouTube with a video game stream that he called the Violent Night Christmas Live Gaming Stream. Hmm. So apparently he had done a similar Christmas themed gaming live stream two years prior as sort of a gift to his viewer community. He starts the stream with an enthusiastic we're live, but told his audience he was having numerous technical problems. He was wearing a Santa hat and he had a Merry Christmas graphic that was right below his chat window. And he kept talking about how flimsy his PC setup was and said, quote, this stream could end at any moment. I'm really worried about it. He also said that the quality of the stream wasn't going to be great and he would be limited to staying in that one screen, um, which, you know, if you ever watch a game stream, like yeah. they'll bounce in and out because exactly. you have one one screen where the game is. And then typically they go to another another screen where they'll chat with people that are in the chat. And sometimes they even show the chat on screen. But. He's locked in on this one screen. Him in the upper right-hand corner, Merry Christmas below him, and then a large window th to the left where his game content was. He decides that he's going to play Grand Theft Auto 3 Vice City, a uh, bit of an older game. He was playing it on his original Xbox, like old, oh, old wow. Xbox. Yeah. Uh, and then several minutes into the live stream, something becomes obvious, and he would actually address it. As people were chatting in the live stream, he wasn't replying. I was about to say, was he acknowledging them? Not mm. really. He's not responding to them. Mm. And seven minutes into the video, he actually says that he can't check the live chat due to the technical challenges that he's having with his PC, you know, trying to stream this. Basically, yeah. he's saying, if I flip out to that window, this whole PC is going to crash and the, the stream will end. So I'm not going to do it. Which... <clears throat> happens yes oh yeah yeah yeah. obs the software we're using just loves to record like, this hmm, let's see boop, boop. <laughs> yeah yeah the, like the, the, off, done. The, the, the thing we're doing to record this right yeah. now for you guys uh is the same software that that he uses and i've had 
crazy, crazy, bizarre experiences. Mm -hmm. I I do live stream weekly, um, and there's there's been insane technical problems. Honestly, most of the stuff he's saying, I've I've had similar situations, but there is something about the chat, Danielle, because you could always take your phone and fire up the yeah. live stream, and then you That's can see. Point. That's how you, I usually do it whenever I live stream. I have yeah. my phone there. Yeah, you could just look at that and then respond to people, just talk to them mm -hmm. based on what you're reading off your phone. But he did kind of address that too. He said, talks amongst yourselves. I sort of hate live streams where people sit and go, oh my God, gosh, ask me questions. Uh, he also notes that if he picks up his cell phone to check the chat, he might just end up stuck scrolling on TikTok. Does that happen, mm -hmm. Daniel? Like if I pick up my phone right now in the middle of recording a show that I'll just, I don't, I don't use TikTok. Do you use TikTok? No, I don't use TikTok. You're joking. Yeah. Yeah. Is it that addictive? I'm, I'm now no, I'm okay. curious. Listen, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. Okay. I will say I have been filming videos a few times, but it's like not live content. Like it's like I'm filming a video just for my regular release on my channel and I will like take a break between like change in topic or something. And I will like for a second reset my brain. And sometimes I will get trapped on like Facebook for a minute. Okay. But if you are no, but if you are live streaming, you're very well aware of what you're doing. And I mean, you live stream a lot. I don't very much anymore, but I used to do a live stream every single week. You don't just casually forget that you're live streaming and start browsing. Like it overtakes your mind. Like you're very yeah. aware of what you are doing. Yes. I've even tried doing a little bit of gaming on my live stream mm -hmm. and I honestly don't enjoy the gaming as much because I'm so aware of exactly. oh I got to keep looking at the chat oh I got yep. I got to cuz it's like it's like you're sitting in a room with a bunch of people and they're talking at you while you're playing it feels like, rude to like not respond you know yeah yeah you <laughs> so feel you can't you do that yeah it kind of pulls you yeah. so it's it's definitely a skill like the guys that do it that are good at it you know, it's it's something I guess you have to grow into. I'm definitely not there yet, but yeah, but you definitely don't just casually get stuck scrolling on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Well, he finally Boy. starts up the gameplay, and for six hours the live stream goes on with him wow. telling stories, drinking Guinness, vaping, just doing what general live streamers do. Mm -hmm. At the end, he switches games for about the last hour, and he winds up playing Battle Bots, which is kind of his namesake, I guess, since that's the thing that got him on TV. Uh, he closes the stream with, I hope everyone enjoyed it and had a nice relaxing time. Well, my computer didn't die. I guess that's a good thing. He also speaks about the magic of the holidays, saying, looking forward to keeping the love alive and passing it on before he signs off just a little after midnight. The following day at 10 p.m. Police and paramedics arrived at the home of 32-year-old Natalie McNally in Lurgan, Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, they were too late. Somebody had viciously stabbed her to death. Oh, man. She was also 15 weeks pregnant. Oh. Investigators found that there were no signs of a break-in, and a postmortem would tell them that she was actually attacked the night before. Earlier... That day of her attack, she watched the World Cup at her parents' house, but then she went home and the mm -hmm. unthinkable happened. Thankfully, investigators did find footage from the previous night. A person of interest spotted walking towards and then later away from her home. Mm -hmm. The footage wasn't great and the man appeared to be wearing a hood, but he was also carrying a backpack. Uh, DCI John Caldwell would tell ITV, at 9.30 p.m., we see him walking out. He appears to be wearing white footwear, possibly trainers. As her family was trying to come to grips with this, her brother yeah. would tell the press that Nats, as we called her, was the only girl in the family, and we treated her like a princess. She lived and coped with being a diabetic from a really early age, and as a result, we were so protective of her, and mm -hmm. yet she was a fiercely independent woman. She worked in marketing and was passionate about her beliefs and loved her animals and music. We're so proud of her many achievements and are completely devastated that she is no longer with us. Crime Stoppers issues a reward of 20,000 euros and investigators mm -hmm. got to work. And remember that, that that was a week before Christmas. Yeah. They, they just spring right in, right through the holidays. Wow. And I don't, I don't want to gloss over that because- That's, I just, imagine- Imagine. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, just imagine, especially if mm -hmm. you're this family going through this and the trauma of having that type of holiday season, there are amazing people out there in law enforcement yeah. that put their personal lives yep. on hold awesome. yep. for things like this. Um, and I, I do, I just and, think that's amazing. And also, even if they're not out there actively searching and investigating, you can best believe that they are thinking about it. They are at home, even if they are with their family, it is on the front of their mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I do appreciate that. And they mm -hmm. they got to work. I mean, they, they started pounding the pavement on this. Uh, so they announced in the media that residents would see an increase in police presence in the coming days. So that means more people yeah. that were probably supposed to have days off. They were coming in. They collected over 3,000 hours of CCTV. Wow. They seized a car and they arrested two men, one of mm -hmm. them being Natalie's boyfriend, Oh, did I forget to mention that that was Stephen McCullough, a.k.a. Vote Saxon 07? Oh, it's but, all falling into place. Well, but both men were cleared as suspects and later released. Not only did Stephen tell him about his live stream, which proved that he was at home playing mm -hmm. GTA 3 on that cranky old Xbox, but his cell phone also showed that he stayed home that night. Hmm. At the three-week point, Police went back to the scene and continued talking to local residents and again asking the press to help them identify that man in the footage. A silent vigil was held for Natalie with her brother Declan saying, everybody in society has to redouble our efforts to end violence against women yep. and girls in memory of our sister Natalie. It really has started a big push mm -hmm. on that front, uh, this case. And this is new, guys. So this is something you can absolutely be a part yep. of, jump in on. Um, I think that is a really important message. We should be ringing that bell more. How many of these cases, Danielle? Literally feels like every single one. <laughs> yeah. Kid you not. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's that same vigil, but mm -hmm. th th there have been several events yeah. in her honor at this point. But I did find a photo of Stephen McCullough attending one of them. Mm -hmm. It's making me feel icky. Yeah. Well, I think you know where this story is going. Yeah. Um, investigators were clearly puzzled by some of the CCTV that they were reviewing. The suspect had supposedly taken a bus to the mm -hmm. location and those buses have cameras on them. So yep. they have footage, but his face was covered the entire time. The body, however, seemed familiar, had a particular kind of walk, particular type of build, not to mention that McCullough was actually the person to find Natalie's body. And mm -hmm. when he when he called it in, he told he had a whole theory on what happened. He told the authorities that her ex-boyfriend had been harassing her. That is never usually a good sign. When it's like an immediate, this is what happened, that is planting a seed more often than not. Well, even the fact that he called it in, because typically... Um, the person that calls it in is at least reviewed as a participant, yep. as a person of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he's he's in a relationship with her. He's already going to be considered anyway yep. outside of that. But they kind of have a certain number of conditions. I've spoken to some detectives before that are like, oh, well, who's the person that called it in? And it's like, ah, uh-huh. Yep. Um, so, yeah, he had this whole story. He tried to tell them about her ex-boyfriend that was harassing her. Investigators started w wondering about that live stream. Mm -hmm. There was no communication from the live chat that seemed to actually influence what he was saying or doing in any way. Deputy Chief, Chief Investigator or DCI Neil McGinnis said, quote, he essentially formed a monologue with his own music and commentary of the game. We became aware that you could pre-record and stream it as if live. Yep. Investigators got a warrant for his computers, and when reviewing that, confirmed that the live stream was indeed pre-recorded. Which I just want to stop and say makes no sense. Like if you're going to pre-record something, just upload it and release it. Mm -hmm. Like why would you try to fake people into thinking that it was a live stream? As if nobody is going to notice that it's not. Yeah, I mean, that's why people go to live streams. They want to in interact. Communication, yeah, yeah, engagement. With each other and with you. Like yeah. it's, there's, there is an aspect to live streams. I mean, there's times where, you know, I'm recording an episode of a podcast in my live stream and I can't pay attention to the chat and I will see, they'll go, go off on other topics and kind of have their own conversations, like sub conversations that mm -hmm. happen in there. 
But oh, I know if anyone has ever been on when I've like premiered a video, it says it's live. It's not. I've pre-recorded it and put it yeah. up. But the comment section, I mean, is just. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't understand why you would actually do this. Not to mention filling out six hours of content or something That's like that. That's what I was just about to say. Six a, whole hours. Yeah. it's But it's it's easier when you're able to interact with people. Like then they give you conversation points. You have things to talk about. Exactly. It's a little back and forth. Like that's part of. So this whole thing is really tough to understand. Come and understand that mm -hmm. that live stream was pre-recorded. He was rearrested on January thirty first of twenty twenty three. Guys, this is very recent stuff, and yep. he was charged with murder. He denies the allegations, but police told McCullough about their findings about the live stream being pre-recorded the following day. After speaking with his attorney, he gave a written statement saying the stream was in fact not live and was actually recorded five days prior and then streamed on the 18th. He also claimed that this was a normal practice for streamers, that it was basically a backup in case he was having PC problems. And honestly, Daniel, I've never heard of anything so silly. Like I was that. about to say, I don't think people have back up six hours of content just no. willy nilly ready to go where you're pretending that it's a live stream. Yeah. What's the point? Like if you were going to stream it five days earlier, just stream it. Exactly. What, like this the difference. This is very baloney. Yeah. The difference in the software between streaming and recording mm -hmm. is literally a button. A button. Yeah. It's one button up or one button down, depending on what you want to do. It makes no sense unless... I guess you could go with the logic that, well, I wanted to release it on the weekend because I thought more people would be able to see it. But that's yeah. the other thing that doesn't matter. Once the live stream goes up, people that want to watch it after can watch it after, yep. including this one. It's mm -hmm. actually still up. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you guys, mm -hmm. I have not reviewed content where I was feeling sick to my stomach in a long time until I was watching parts of this live stream. But... uh. So he uh, did have his lawyer kick in that statement. They do basically admit that it was recorded, but he's coming up with this excuse and saying that it's a normal thing. It's not. I'm not aware of anyone that does mm -hmm. this. No. Uh, he, but he does also say that he was still at home at that time, though, that he was basically drinking and he fell asleep while the recorded live stream played. And those live stream went from like 6 p.m. till just after midnight. Investigators believe that he started the live stream, then took a bus to his girlfriend's neighborhood, mm -hmm. killed her, changed clothes mm -hmm. there, then hijacked a taxi that was actually meant for someone else. Like he got in front of a pub and someone had called for a taxi. He jumped in. He just in got and, right in. Yeah. yeah, and said that was me. And when the taxi driver wanted to take him to a different place, he's like, no, 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 no plans changed. My mom's not feeling good. I need to go over here. Whoa, that's thinking ahead. That's yeah. like kind of crazy. Well, and I'm also wondering if he was worried about like running out of time. Like mm -hmm. if, if he was worried that the live stream was going to run out of tape before he got back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, and they did, investigators did locate the taxi driver who actually dropped off this mm -hmm. suspect. Yeah. But he, he happened to drop him off right in front of Stephen's home. Oh, convenient. Yeah. And Danielle. If everything about this case wasn't already terrible enough, in between this time, like when, when he was first checked mm -hmm. and released, he went to Natalie's family's home after her death, supposedly to visit with them, which is already weird because he'd only met them twice before. Him and Natalie were only dating for about four months. I was about to ask that. Like, what on earth? Like, yeah. what, was this like? Yeah. No, they, they, they started dating in August. Uh, so yeah, they were only dating four months. He had only met them twice, but he decides he was going to go to their house and, and be supportive of what was happening. He leaves the home, but then, oh, he has to come back an hour later. Danielle accidentally left his phone behind. You know why? Cause he was recording their conversation what? after he left. Yes. He left his phone recording in their house to see if he was a suspect. At least that's what the investigators think. He took his phone home. He copied the audio file from his phone to his PC so he could also review it there. Now, 
I have no words so far. Like literally none. Seriously. Seriously. And it honestly, there's something about this case. The term ego just mm-hmm. comes out so strongly in it that it's even got yeah. me kind of doing like a check on myself. I'm like, wow, am I this kind of jerk? Like, it, I know yeah. that there's something about people. Hey, we want to be on YouTube. We're putting our faces out here. I get it. There's something in our personality <laughs> where we're looking for something from other people, acknowledgement, yeah. whatever. Um, but the the lengths that this guy is going to. I like, mean, it's extreme. Like, it's not just simple to sit down. And I mean, this is a whole laid out plan of him sitting down faking an entire six hour live stream to pre-record it thinking of all the logistics of it and what are people going to say and like just saying as a youtuber myself like that's a lot of bases to cover because people can be all over the place and he seemingly like thought of almost every single thing that someone could say down to look at it on your phone and yeah i mean just well and that's where that's where i think we need some analysis on this, right? Because I know Mm -hmm. we're supposed to be looking for bad alibis here. And some of you might actually be thinking, this is super planned, like very well thought out. But was it? Because I know that some people can feel like people in social media can be a a bit egocentric. Mm -hmm. But what's the point of a live stream if you're not actually paying any attention to the audience? Yeah, exactly. I mean, particularly when people are donating through Super Chat, which they did on his live stream. Oh, God. I would not sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. No no dono shout outs in that live stream. And while it was smart that he was playing an old Xbox because that's a console that you can change the date and time on super easily. It doesn't talk to the internet. It doesn't go to... Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. That's why it was the old Xbox he was playing. I'm I'm almost 100% sure. There's no tracking on it. Plus, he was playing Grand Theft Auto 3, which didn't really have any integration with internet servers. Yeah. Like like nowadays, some of these games, even the games that are single player, sometimes they'll have elements Mm -hmm. of the game where another player can, even if just their score shows up on your scoreboard or something like that, there's an internet tap that happens there. And of course, Mm -hmm. there's a timestamp with that. Grand Theft Auto 3, there's no integration with the internet. You could play that completely offline. Um, So, yeah. But the thing is, despite how smart those steps are, Mm -hmm. the dude names the stream the Violent Night Christmas Gaming Stream. I had totally forgotten that he did that. I remember, like, when you said that, I was like, that's weird. (laughs) Why? Yeah. And it's not, I mean, GTA, I mean, there's, like, a violent-ish element to it, but it's not, like, the main... You know, I mean, the way he was playing it, it depends how you play it, right? Yeah, it's very you know? true. And you can kind of go whichever way with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm telling you guys, I didn't watch the whole six hours. I watched too much of it. Like if you watch mm-hmm. 30 seconds of it, you're going to feel like you've watched too much of it. The entire first 10 minutes are just one obvious excuse after another trying yeah. to explain away the problems and cover up the fact that it's actually pre-recorded. Yeah. And there are other problems just inherently like he's not actually a regular live streamer it had been at least a so year this since his last one yeah totally one off that it's kind of yeah. like oh that's weird why are you doing that <laughs> yeah well and even since his last one that was a year prior it wasn't a video game live stream it had mm-hmm. actually been two years since he had done his last video game oh yeah that other christmas yeah. holiday one yeah right also someone trying to pull off something like this probably thinks like there's some kind of genius and of course some of those guys can't help but add little winks about how smart they are, right? Yep. Uh, he was cussing in the game at one point. He had this mission that was going horribly wrong, and he was saying mm-hmm. the F word over and over. And all of a sudden, Natalie's name just becomes part of, of him cussing. Yeah. What? Yeah. And then later he discusses how it's going to be a really good Christmas. And he's got this really bizarre grin on his face while he's saying it. Oh, I'm so thoroughly grossed out by this person. Yeah. He went on this whole rant about how police are understaffed in their area and how criminals are getting away with crimes regularly. It's like he just couldn't help himself but to run his mouth. He had to say something. He had to get something out there to make him feel satisfaction. Oh, but he justified that one by saying he does his crimes in video games. That's why he was playing GTA 3. And 
probably the craziest thing, in what he claims was some kind of technical glitch. He did have another screen that would come up for him to go take breaks occasionally, oh, about no. once an hour. Okay. Oh, no. He came back from one of these breaks, and all of a sudden, a James Bond poster pops up on screen for the movie titled No Time to Die. And then the poster mm -hmm. disappears, and he comes up with this excuse about, oh, that was weird. Why did that poster show up? Oh, it was from some other thing I did before. What so, in the world, John? If this was a brilliant alibi, which on a technical front, I'm sure some people are impressed by it. Yeah. His execution of it turned it into complete garbage based yeah. on what largely seems like his ego. Like this dude's mm -hmm. ego is just all over this. Yep. I mean, honestly, Danielle, he was arrested within about six weeks of her murder. So how good is this alibi? Ugh. Um, he was smart enough to leave his phone at home, but that was also problematic because his phone had no activity on it for like five hours, which is... Strange, like Danielle. Big old red flag. Yeah, think of your phone from mm -hmm. 6 p.m. to 11 or, or midnight. Is it going to have some form of activity? Oh, at absolutely. Least? Yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, taxi driver drops mm -hmm. off the suspect. Three minutes later, his phone oh. gets unlocked. Wow. Imagine that. <laughs> Isn't that... So. Good grief. Apparently, the court process moves very quickly in Ireland. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. At, I was at, expecting you to say the opposite for a minute and I was worried. Well, I, I don't, I mean, the initial process has mm -hmm. moved really fast. They've already had his bail hearing. They've got okay, other, well. other hearings that are happening. There's been a delay, right? I think they're starting to review a bunch of more information at this point. But mm -hmm. at his bail hearing, District Judge Rosie Waters told the court, I don't know if I've ever come across a case that is so complex. If the police are right, this was a cold-blooded attack, which yep. has meticulous planning. If he can carry out an attack like this, who knows what else he's capable of, and the planning involves a knowledge of technology that's far above my head, which I have to admit, like there's there's a lot of people out there who don't play games, don't know about OBS, don't know about all these systems and stuff exactly. like that. Um, and you know him banking that that's going to be the entire police department. I think a little short sighted. Yeah, I agree with you. They've they've got their technical review unit. Mm -hmm. They 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 know how to look at this stuff. As for motive, the prosecution seems to think that they've spotted a pattern from a previous relationship that he had, where he attacked a woman. No. In that case, he saw that she was communicating with another man. He got upset, and I. If I'm, if I'm recalling this correctly, I think he struck her, but actually told police like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, she got what she should have. She was talking to another <laughs> oh. guy. But oh my gosh. She did not continue to press charges. So that whole thing got dropped. No. Yeah. Now the night before Natalie's murder, mm -hmm. McCullough actually stayed at her home that night. And investigators found out that her phone was unlocked several times, like in the early morning hours. Mm -hmm. With her, who that was mm -hmm. exactly with her WhatsApp and her Twitter being looked at, but no messages, no interactions actually happening. And they did find a family member who said that Natalie told them that she had given her password to Stephen previously. That is paranoia, but almost to the level of where you're hoping to find a problem. Yeah, like yeah. you're looking for it. You're looking for trouble. Right. Right. And if it is a pattern like that, if if this did actually occur with this previous girlfriend exactly. before. Yeah, I was about to like say, he's, you, if he's only been dating her for four months, like what on earth serious. could have transpired? Like this makes absolutely no sense. Serious. So uh, yes. And they did find that she did have messages in there where she was talking to her, her yeah. ex-boyfriend. So mm -hmm. uh, they believe that was part of the catalyst for her death. And the exactly. other possible part of that was her being pregnant. The articles that I've seen are saying it was his child. I just have a little question mark in my mind because who knows? Like if she, if she yeah. was still connected to her ex-boyfriend, maybe there was something going on there. I don't know. But her death has brought a lot of attention to the conversation around violence towards women. Hundreds of people turned out for a march in her honor. Her brother would say, I cannot actually put into words the heartache we're experiencing. She was the life and soul of our family. Mm -hmm. We're devastated that we will never meet Natalie's baby. We were all looking forward to welcoming the family's first grandchild and nephew or niece into the world next year. 
as for his alibi, that video is still up. I've already said it. My stun my stomach absolutely yeah. turning as I watched it. Many people are asking for it to be taken down. It's, I'm surprised it's not already been taken down. Like yeah. that shocks me that it's still up. It's still up. I mean, there's Yeah. I don't know well, though, because I will say I've looked into a couple of things where there's videos up and they're just from like 10, 15 years ago. There's or not 10, 15 years ago, but like 10 years ago, and they're still up. Like from when YouTube first started and Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the video now has 148,000 views where his previous live streams would usually get around two. He's got one that has seven and everything else is basically two or less. And of course, Danielle and myself know that YouTube isn't super responsive to things no. all the time. Uh, one of the publications did get a message from a YouTube spokesperson who said, we've established pr processes in place to review these requests closely to determine if content should be removed because it violates an applicable law or our policies. And I guess technically there's no crime that's actually happening in the footage outside of the stuff he's doing in the game. But and they're not really worried about like the morality of it. And like, if it's ex like, if that's something that should remain public apparently not man that and that's a weird gross. thing because if nothing oh else thinking about it from the family's perspective it's yes it's pre-recorded mm -hmm. but that supposed live stream is essentially a time stamp of him pulling off this crime it's absolutely terrible it's sh they should pull it they should pull it down mm -hmm. yep I, I mean at a minimum if not just shut down his whole channel i mean I I th would... i'm yeah. I'm pretty sure they have some clauses about um, they've got to have like some decency clauses in there that if you're if you're found to have done something wrong, that that could be enough for terminating your channel. There has there's, to be. There's got to be something in there. I mean, at the, but it, it just makes me angry because why not? Like, what is it going to hurt to just take it down? Do they yeah. really think this man's going to come in a legal battle right, with them right. to try to like get his video? reposted again no right for his ad revenue yeah I mean, so yeah. like come on just take the video down yeah. <laughs> just take it down his request for bail was denied and they have delayed the next court hearing for several weeks while the legal teams prepare first it was the defense that was kind of rolling yeah. things back and now the prosecution saying hey we need more time too um but we're you know we record these episodes a little bit ahead of the first of the month and they are having another court date in a few days. So by the time you guys see this, there's probably there might be an update, yeah. Yeah, there's probably some new news on it. So uh, if you have been grabbed by the story, I know I'm gonna keep up to date on it. Um, set up a Google News alert or, mm -hmm. or run a search and and see what's happening with it. Um, and honestly, blowing away his alibi, we know that that's not going to be enough to win this on its no. own. They That's have what's to, scaring me, yeah. Yeah, they have to prove he's the guy on the bus. They got to prove he's the guy in the CCT footage from the street. Mm -hmm. They got to prove that he went into her house, that he did commit this act. Um, there is, I guess there was more than just stabbing damage done to her. There's mm -hmm. some type of blunt force injury. They're not sure what that object is. So if that object could be located, maybe that would help with part of this puzzle. But another big piece of the puzzle seemingly has fallen into place. The taxi driver says that he actually recognized McCullough and that he knew McCullough basically from him being on TV, being on the on the robot oh, stuff. Oh, that came back to bite him. Yeah. So um, we'll see. All that being said, as of when we're recording mm -hmm. this, his guilt or innocence has yet to be determined. Exactly. So. And I do know that we have listeners in that part of the world. If there is any information out there that can mm -hmm. help this case, please call it in to Crime Stoppers UK. You can call it in anonymously on 0800-555-111, or you can visit them online at crimestoppers-uk.org. And a big thank you to ITV, LinkedIn, of course, YouTube, The Guardian, The Sun, Metro, Belfast Telegraph, Sunday World, Irish News, and Belfast Live for information contributing to this mess of a story. Mm. I mean, I feel like the level of effort that went into both of our stories to create an alibi is yeah. so wild to me. Yeah, yeah. Makes you wonder about people. Oh, we absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Wow, um, that was a big one. 
both of us. Yeah, yeah. I think we both were. I think we're running a little long on this episode. Um, but as always, mm-hmm. we did bring extra stories, and I think we need some kind of palate cleanser yep. off that because these Something. stories did go dark. Yep. Um, I have two, and Daniel has one, so I'm going to go first, and then uh, we'll we'll take it from there. What if you have the perfect alibi, and you just don't remember it? Well, that happened to LaDondrill Montgomery. He was accused of armed robbery. There was an eyewitness that identified him, the clerk Mm -hmm. that he actually robbed. There was surveillance video. There was a conviction, and LaDondrill wound up getting a sentence of life in prison. Wow. But one week after his sentencing, his attorney was looking over his rap sheet and found something very interesting. It was a report detailing his release from prison on a different charge nine hours after the robbery that he had just been convicted for. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) LaDondrell had probably the best alibi that anyone could. He was actually in jail at the time of the robbery. Oh, (laughs) my goodness. (laughs) And how... Wait a minute. How do you not remember that? How do you not remember it? Because he had so many criminal activities, Daniel. Oh, <laughs> this guy great. was so in and like, out. So he just couldn't remember what yeah. he did that particular day. <laughs> His attorney said, we asked him where he was on all the cases he's been charged yeah. with. And he just couldn't remember for that particular date where he was. Uh, so his conviction was thrown out, but LaDondrell wasn't quite a free man. He was still facing five other counts of robbery for other occurrences, and he would be convicted on one of those and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Well, (laughs) at least there was one that he wasn't responsible for. Right, right. We'll just be thankful for that. Yeah, and it's not a life sentence. It's a 45-year sentence for a guy that's in his 30s. I'm telling you what. Yeah. Now... I might be able to 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 do you one up here. Okay, all right. This one's actually absolutely crazy to me because I feel like there's not too many story like stories out there where wild alibis are given or you know they're all involving very dark things. Clearly, the rest of this episode. So instead, I was like, you know what? I want to highlight an alibi that actually had a man's sentence totally taken away. All right. Forty-year-old Richard Rosario had been charged with the murder of a 16-year-old boy in the Bronx in 1996. And at the time, Richard was 20 years old. And this young man was killed like broad daylight, in the middle of a street, okay? Despite no forensic or physical evidence, somehow Richard Rosario was convicted. There were apparently a couple of eyewitnesses that were there, watched this go down. They said they're pretty sure it was Richard. I think there were three of them total. One of them said it for sure was not him. And then two other people that they brought in looked through like books and they're like, oh yeah, this picture of this guy, definitely him. And so ultimately Richard was sentenced to 25 years to life, but he wasn't having a problem remembering where he was or an alibi. He actually had a big one and it was ignored. So what's wild about this is when Richard found out news that he was being looked into for this murder, He stopped everything he was doing and wrote down a list of 13 people that could corroborate his alibi, that he was not even in the Bronx. He was 1,000 miles south in Florida at the time of the murder. He wasn't there. And he did this before authorities even questioned him. He's like, oh, no, I'm not getting pinned for this. Sat down, list of paper, wrote down 13 names. These were all the people that saw me in Florida. I can prove that I wasn't there. And apparently... Authorities never spoke to a single one of those individuals to corroborate his alibi. That's not good. That's really not good. What's even better is the fact that he had court-appointed attorneys. Yeah. Do you think they looked into it? Oh, come on. Yeah. Now, they did one better, and they did bring two of those individuals that were technically in this list to testify. And Mm -hmm. these two had actually been the couple that Richard had stayed with while down in Florida. And they did. They were like, he was in Florida. He was literally staying in our home. But remember how we talked about how people don't sometimes believe (laughs) what close friends and family and whatever have to say? It was not believed. They were deemed unreliable until Mm -hmm. 20 years later. 
in 2016. Yeah, you heard me right. 20 years later, his sentence was vacated. But they were like, we are aware that you had the, this alibi. It wasn't looked into. It should have been looked into. But we plan on doing a retrial. We just have to dive into this evidence first. Like they still were so sure that he was responsible. He was exonerated. Every single one of those witnesses that they could have had a five minute conversation with 20 years ago remembered and were fully able to say that he was for a fact in Florida. Wow. And so he was exonerated all these years later by this alibi that he had this entire time that no one had looked into. After 20 years? 20 years. He was awarded $5 million. He was almost going to get paroled. Yeah. Probably. Uh -huh. he, was he was about, on 25 was, to life. Yeah, it was 25 to life. He was up like around the corner from, you know. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. So absolutely wild. How do you have an alibi like that? And, you know, from the beginning and somehow it's just not looked into. Yeah. I mean, I mean I've I've heard bizarre stats on like, you know, how much time public defenders mm -hmm. get with the people they're working with. They get like no time. But oh, I mean, I can imagine. But if that's what the entire there's no physical evidence, there's no what, what right. are you arguing about then? If you're not right. arguing about the alibi, which is the one thing you seem to have, like if there's nothing else to argue about other than these witnesses that are saying, oh, yeah, we think that was him. Yeah. You would think they would have pulled out every stop possible. Yeah. And somehow well, it just didn't happen. 20 years of your life, I'm pretty sure someone's going to get some type of settlement. Mm -hmm. Yep. He got his $5 that. million. Dollars. Oh, he did. He sure yeah. did. And he actually like has become very public about this. And he's like standing up to the issues within the Justice Department because he's like, yeah, you literally screwed over two people like me. You put me in prison for 20 years and two that victim like he someone's out there that did this to him and you didn't even catch him. You didn't even. You focused on me. So yeah. wild. But how crazy is that for an alibi to pull through 20 years later? It's insane. It's insane. Mm. All right. Well, we're going to end this with one that's, this is more of a terrible excuse than an alibi. Which, which is what you typically see on the internet. <laughs> yeah. When we look at the list, yeah. I remember when we researched it the first time we ran into mm -hmm. the same thing. It was like, wait, these lists are actually excuses. They're not alibis. They're not alibis. But, <laughs> so I'm going to throw one in just for good old time's sake. A man in Framingham, Massachusetts, was walking his dog when he saw a car driving fast in the opposite lane. It was a 30 mile per hour zone and the car was clearly going over 60. The man waved his hand, trying to signal the driver to slow down. But maybe the driver thought the man wanted a ride oh, because no. all of a sudden <laughs> the car was coming right at him. It's like, oh, you need a ride? Hold on, let me speed up. Yeah. The man, the pedestrian, grabbed his dog and jumped out of the way. The car then turned around and made another run at him, Danielle. Oh, no. The police were called. They tracked down the 19-year-old driver when they asked him why he almost hit the pedestrian and his dog twice. Yeah. The man said, well, the alignment on my steering's out of whack and the car just turns on its own. <laughs> Listen, if your car's alignment is so bad that it pulls U-turns randomly. <laughs> yeah. There's a big problem. Yeah, and I think you're still responsible. How about that? Yeah, you're still responsible. And why you would ever think that that's an acceptable excuse? Oh, it's just my alignment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, goodness. So he was arrested and charged with assault with a dangerous weapon. As he should, because I would love to know. I would love to know the truth behind that. Like, what were you, just for fun? Like, come on. I did run into some other details on it. I think on the second pass, he actually was running up on the guy again and and sla like slammed the brakes, like stopped the car and yelled something out the window about like, meet me back here at 10. Was like, he trying to fight people? Yeah, like he wanted to <laughs> fight. <laughs> Which makes the excuse about the alignment even weaker. <laughs> if it was your alignment, why did you tell him to come out? <laughs> like, you know, right. how about that? Like, why are you yeah, trying to no. fight people? No, I meant, like, come, oh, no. I meant meet me here at 10 so you could fix my alignment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought that the gas pedal was the brake. Like, what? Right, right. We just keep going for days on that one. Oh my gosh. Well, Danielle, <laughs> who's gonna ride. win this? Who's gonna win this month? I know. I, I feel exhausted. <laughs> Who Honestly, is going to win? That's a good question. Because that was rough all the way around. Both of those mm -hmm. were absolutely terrible alibis with like so much thought put into it. 
yeah. to cover up someone's actions. That's absolutely crazy. But it's not up to us. It is up to you guys. You get to vote on who told the world's worst alibi story. And you can vote for the first seven days over on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod or... You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also always have a link in the description box down below. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the little letter I in the corner and take you there as well. That's right. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon and shop our Teespring store. And a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. We do a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It is so much fun, you guys. We played Would You Rather today. You will love it. <laughs> plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Don't forget, you can come and meet us, plus attend our final episode. Daniel, if my voice, I'm getting emotional. You're right. I was going to say, don't cry, John. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Too emotional. I think we have, we have six left. We have six episodes left with it wow. all ending at CrimeCon Orlando in September of 2023. We really want you guys to come and meet up with us for this big finale. It means a lot to us. And if you're mm -hmm. wondering how to get your name on the guest list and also get a bunch of free crime after crime swag, which if you've ever been to CrimeCon and see the stuff John hands out, it's great. <laughs> just saying. Visit <laughs> CrimeCon.com and buy a standard CrimeCon pass today using the code crime after crime with no spaces. And then email your receipt to crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com. That's crimeaftercrime at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S.com. The sooner the better because we do have a limited number of seats and swag and you don't want to miss out. And of course, we're going to be back next month with a brand new, fresh topic for all you guys. This is one I'm really excited about. Great suggestion from several of you. Mm -hmm. Aussie crimes. Buckle in. Yeah, yeah. What do you got for us, Australia? I'm looking at you. We're going to check out your crimes. It's going to be interesting. I'll tell you that. I've already said I've only covered a couple of things that have happened in Australia. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going to see. Oh, yeah. This is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And have a great month. And we'll see you next time on Crime After Crime. Take care, everybody.